The reading this morning is from 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 1 to 12, page 1187 in the Pew Bibles, Living to Please God. Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in passionate lust like the heathen who do not know God, and that in this matter no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. Now about brotherly love, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all the brothers throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you brothers to do so more and more. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business and to work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Amen. Father God, on this Pentecost Sunday, we thank you for the reminder from Acts 2 that you gave your Holy Spirit to the apostles, that Peter saw that time as the fulfillment of scriptures when you promised that you would pour out your Spirit on all people and that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Lord, this morning as we pray for the needs of our world, The greatest need is of having your spirit live in the lives of men and women, boys and girls, so that they may be saved and know how to live for the living and true God. Father, our hearts are heavy again this morning as we pray for cities and people who've been affected by bombings and killings and terrorist acts. Father, we pray for the city of Kabul today, where seven were killed and a hundred injured at a funeral that was bombed. Father, we bring before you the city of Manila as 36 die because of a man who set fire to a casino. Father, into your presence we bring in prayer Mosul and how dozens were shot as they sought to leave parts of the city occupied by IS. And Lord God, as we woke this morning in our small part of the world, Father, you know the terror and devastation that has occurred in London last night. Father, we pray for those families who've lost loved ones, who were out on a night out, and who were taken. We pray for the police officer who was injured and all those who had stab wounds or were injured by the van that was hit by them. Father, we need your Holy Spirit to change lives, to change our world so that people have a greater allegiance, a greater love than a nation, an ideology or race. And Father, we ask, pour out your spirit, draw men and women onto yourself so that this world may be turned upside down by the good news of Jesus, we pray. Father God, you're working out your plans and purposes. May these recent attacks in Manchester and London and across the world draw many to search for you, to seek you, and to find in you the one who can save, who can restore, who can bring new life and hope for your glory and honor, we pray these things. Father God, we pray especially for the meetings that will be conducted over this week of the General Assembly of our church. We pray for those times of worship and gathering together to hear your word, that there'll be a tangible sense of your presence in those places. We pray and give you thanks for all the work that has been achieved over the past year as reports are given. We ask that you will guide and lead by your Holy Spirit on resolutions and decisions and debates that have to be resolved, decided and voted on. We pray for your hand to be upon certain key decisions that will be that more controversial be it because of disagreements or conflict. And we ask throughout this week that there'll be a pervading attitude of godly conduct 
wisdom, and love, a desire, Father, to see your church grow in this island and further afield. We pray especially for Frank and Claire, especially as they come into these final few weeks of their moderatorial year. We pray for Frank as he reflects on this year publicly on Monday. Fill him with thankfulness. And as he hands over the role of public representative to the church, to Noble and to Florence, may they be an encouragement to the wider church, be winsome in their dealings and attitude with all that they do this year. Lord, undertake for your church, we pray. Father God, in a year that has seen much change and upheaval politically, we thank you for the freedom to vote on Thursday without fear or intimidation. Lord, we pray for all who are putting their name forward for election, and we ask that you will give each of us wisdom and clarity as to how to vote on Thursday. Lord, may those who are elected work for the good of people here, representing well, working hard for peace, for the ongoing well-being of people. Lord, continue to work in our MLAs as they continue to work out what power sharing will look like after this election. And so, Father, into your hands we commit this Thursday and we commit these months ahead. Father, we thank you for the privilege it is to pray and to come before you. And we pray for our church family. We pray for those on our left and right of us this morning, that you'll have your hand upon them. Father, we pray for those who are anxious, for those who are fearful, for those who have been blessed and are thankful and rejoice today. And Father, we commit them to you. Lord, in your name, we pray these things, asking you to pour out your spirit that many will see Jesus and the glory of the good gospel that he has. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can I encourage you to take a, a pew Bible and turn to page 1187, where you'll find 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So page 1187. And as you're doing that, let me pray for us this morning. Father, thank you for the words that we have just been singing. Purify my heart, cleanse me from within and make me holy. My heart's one desire is to be holy. I choose to be holy, set apart for you, my master, ready to do your will. Father, as we come to your will revealed in the scriptures this morning, we pray for your spirit's enabling and help as we seek to respond in obedience and humility to your word today. Lord, help us, be our teacher, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please keep that passage open in front of you. Last week, if you were here, you would have remembered that in the end of chapter 12, 3, verse 12 and 13, we saw that Paul prayed for two specific things, three things, in fact. One, that God would make the way clear for him to go back to these Thessalonian Christians, and then second was verse 12, do you see it? Where it says that he prayed that their love, that the Lord would make their love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else. And then thirdly, he prayed that the Lord would strengthen their hearts, verse 13, so that they would be holy and blameless in the presence of our God when Jesus comes again. And we were encouraging each of us to pray these prayers both for ourselves and for our church. And the question is this this morning, what does this look like? What does a life of love which overflows and increases look like practically? What does a holy and blameless life look like in practice? Because it sounds lovely to pray, but in practice, what does it mean? Well, this morning, chapters 4, verses 1 to 12, go a long way in showing us what this looks like in a practical, concrete terms. But I first want to begin chapter 4 by reading a somewhat debatable yet controversial quote from the late John Stott, who said this in, in 1986, in fact, but it's quite relevant today. He said this, one of the greatest weaknesses of contemporary evangelical Christianity is our comparative neglect of Christian ethics. What Stott is saying here is that evangelical Christians and the church at large have neglected to speak 
about Christian ethics. Those are the moral principles that govern your life, that make your lifestyle, that make your choices, and those ethical decisions. It involves Christian morals, Christian behavior, principles, and beliefs. And I wonder, is this true? Because it seems to me, even our evening service, that we're focusing on these big doctrines of justification, of faith alone, which are all lovely, aren't they? And they're great doctrines because they impact practically. But I wonder, is thought right that we've neglected Christian ethics, the practical side of things? Maybe we've shied away from neglected teaching on certain issues such as abortion, such as end-of-life concerns, sexuality, behavior, and conduct. And from chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, do you see it there? You will see that Paul could never be accused of neglecting to teach on Christian ethics. He didn't shy away or, or, or neglect from teaching these disciples at Thessalonica how to live. He didn't leave it up to themselves. Here's the teaching. You put it into practice. See how it works. No, look at verse 1. It says this, and this is Paul writing. He says, we instructed you how to live in order to please God. Verse 2, for you know what instructions we gave you. Paul intentionally and deliberately gave instructions to these young believers in the way they were to live so as to please God. Now, there's a way to please God. So that verse assumes that there is a way of conducting ourselves, a way of living that pleases God. And Paul, for his short time with these Christians, must have spelt out this way of life, the morals, the behavior, the lifestyle that pleases God. And these Thessalonian Christians have taken these instructions on board. That is why within verses 1 and 2, Paul is encouraged. He's saying to him, do it more and more. Continue to live like this. And what follows onwards, from verse 3 onwards, is further instruction, commands to these Christians regarding loving others and being holy and blameless. And it's quite specific, and there are principles for us here today to apply as well. But the interesting thing with this is that Paul is aware, and I think it is fair to say, that we're living in a time, aren't we, when one of the reasons that Christians and the church shy away from biblical commands and instructions, such as this morning's, is because the pervading attitude can be like this one, and it might be coming up on the screen don't tell me what to do. You cannot tell me what to say or be or act. And this type of response knows that authority is important. Who are you to say this to me? And Paul is aware of this. Who is Paul to come to the Thessalonian Christians and tell them about loving others? Who is he to tell them and talk about sexual behavior and conduct? And Paul at the end of verse 2 said, makes it clear that these instructions are not his own ideas. They are not his little pep talk to this group of Christians. They're not words of wisdom that he gleaned along the way. The instruction and commands that are given here are by the authority of the Lord Jesus. He could have said Jesus, but he says Lord Jesus. Paul is the messenger. The source and giver of these commands and instructions is Jesus, the Lord, to these Christians at Thessalonica. That is the authority So if you hear nothing else this morning, you've got to grapple with the fact that whatever is written after verse 3, that these are the instructions that God has given, that the Lord Jesus gives to his people, both in Thessalonians' day, but also in ours as principles. It is vital to understand that for the Christian, that the commands of Scripture, those instructions that inform us to do something, are not made up by men and women or an institution. They are not some agony ant advice that you can take it or leave it. Rather, they carry weight and authority because they're from the Lord Jesus himself. That is the bone of contention both for Christians and non-Christians. That is a major game changer for the Christian because what comes in these instructions and commands of Scripture, so often for the non-Christian and even for the Christian, they will say this, what right has Scripture to tell me how to live? That scriptures are all about do's and don'ts, and we'll come back to that. That the commands are there to limit our freedom and control us. Paul this morning is clear to the Thessalonians and to us from the outset that the instructions here given in verse 3 onwards are by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And this takes us to verses 3 to 8, 
where it says here in the lovely opening line, do you see it? It says, God's will is that you should be sanctified. What Paul begins his instruction by reminding them of this great truth, that it is God's will, his desire, his purpose, that you should be sanctified. The word sanctified here means that idea of being made holy. That's why we had those songs this morning about God's holiness, about the response of purify my heart, because that is what God wants to do. He wants to set aside a people who are holy, just as he is holy, who will live blameless and holy lives. That word sanctify is an ongoing process we heard about last week. And here he comes and he said, it is God's will that you be changed, that you'll be transformed continually in our thinking, our mind, our heart, and our life, so to be and live as Christ-like people and who are holy and blameless. Have you ever thought about that as, as a will for your life? Many of us think, you know, what's God's will for me? You know, what, what's his purposes for me? One of the fundamental ones is that God wants to sanctify you, change us, make us his people, make us Christ-like in how we think, how we behave, and how we live our lives. That is one of his purposes. This is God's will for us. He is committed to it. That's why that lovely verse, do you remember it in Philippians 1 verse 6 where it says this, Paul says to the church, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen to that. That he has begun a work in the Christian, that he will continue to transform and change, making us more like his people until the day he comes back or he takes you home. And one of the areas that God is sanctifying his people is in the whole area of sexual behavior and conduct, which you find in verses three to eight. Get this background first, which may be a be of help. These Thessalonians had come from a background of idol worship. Do you remember that in chapter one? It was part of their culture and lifestyle. It was who they were. The city of Thessalonica was known to have imperial cults. That means they were worshiping gods of different varieties. The people of Thessalonica worshiped Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love and beauty. Other gods like Zeus and Apollo, among other deities. And often the worship of these gods involved engaging in all sorts of sexual behavior and exploits. This was the culture and the background of the day in Thessalonica. And for us today, there's no doubt we're living in a time when our culture and our media, be it online or print, is saturated with idolatry of different forms. And some of it is sexual in nature. I had a brief read of some of the online broadsheet newspapers on Friday morning, and the amount of sexual assault cases was staggering. And the moment, at the moment, maybe some of you watch it, Coronation Street is running a narrative or a story about a grooming story, and it's caused awful havoc for Ofcom because they've got complaints, because people are not able to deal with it or watch it. And so our saturation of the sexual content, and what this, these court cases and stories highlight is that a culture and lifestyle, the way things are for us and our world we live in is not too dissimilar to the Thessalonians' world. And that's what makes the instructions in verses three to eight relevant, but deeply challenging. God's will is that you should be sanctified. And so verse three says that you should avoid sexual immorality. The word sexual immorality here is the word porneia in the Greek, which means sexual intercourse or sex. And so Paul is writing to these Christians and is telling them to avoid or abstain from sexual relations. But the question you have to ask is, in what context? In what environment? It is clear in biblical teaching that throughout scripture, it shows that sex is a God-given gift from the beginning. Remember those famous words of Genesis. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. There is the leaving, the clinging, and becoming one flesh, a reference to sexual intercourse to sex. The biblical teaching is that sex within the marriage covenant, and it is between one man and one woman, is a creation ordinance. God's idea, we did not make up this. It is not ours to own, it is not ours to change even. God's design and will for people like you and I is this, that sex is within the marriage covenant. 
And this creation ordinance hasn't been altered or changed despite the fall or disobedience of humanity. It was and is God's purpose for marriage and sex. And here in 1 Thessalonians, Paul says to these Christians, with the authority of Jesus to avoid sexual immorality, to avoid sex outside of marriage. For Christians today, there is no doubt we're living in a time when our culture, our media, our education, even the world we work, rest, and play in is saturated with sexual immorality. It's portrayed and alluded to in song lyrics. I was going to show One Direction. Do you know the song? Live while you're young. Tell me what that's about. <laughs> Tell me what that's alluding to. Books and films, Fifty Shades of Grey, various TV dramas, Game of Thrones. And these are easy pickings. Let, let's not be too, I'm not, I'm not, these are easy to pick out. There are others that are more subtle. They all portray sex outside of marriage as normal, as the right of an individual. And we understand this, but we also absorb it. And in time, it just becomes the way things are done in our culture. And that is why, folks, this morning as we come to a passage particularly like 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3, it is radical and it is transformative for the Christian and the Christian community. Because being part of a sanctified community which has been changed means that God in his goodness and graciousness commands us to avoid, to abstain from sexual immorality, sexual relations outside of the covenant of marriage. And God's word not only states that, here's the don't, but it also tells us something else in verse 4. Do you read it? That each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. If you get a chance and you want to explore this a bit more, get a, get a good commentary, may, maybe Stott's one or, or Beale, which I've been working off of, and you'll realize that there's plenty of ink <laughs> been spilt on these verses, particularly verse 4. There are four different inter interpretations concerning this verse, and they depend on what you understand of the words control and body. And so once you've got those grasped in your mind and your heart, then that informs your interpretation. And so I'm just going to unravel it in the sense of this. The main principle here is that each woman and man is to learn to control his own body when it comes to sexual desire and sexual relations in a holy and honorable manner and way. What a radical and controversial thing to say this morning. That the Bible is saying to us with God's authority, you are to avoid sexual immorality. That you are to learn to control your own body in a way that is honorable and holy. And so if you're single today, learn to control yourself when it comes to your desires. Surely this implication of this is that you need to learn to control what you do, what you see, what you watch, how you respond when it comes to sexual desires and relationships. It's about learning self-control. Teenagers, there's plenty of them here today, and young adults, you are living in a world which will bombard you with false, untrue images and realities concerning sexual identity, desire, and sexual relationships, and how they should be understood and engaged in. Your own desires at times will be confused, at, and you will not know what way to go. But keep this in mind and heart, that God loves his people. He has given sex and the gift of it for good purposes, for that secure, covenant bond of marriage between one man and woman for life. And so avoid sexual relationships until marriage. Don't mess around. Don't flirt around with the boundaries of it. Learn now to control your thoughts, your heart and attitude and actions in an honorable and holy way so that if you get married in the future, it will be a delight and joy to share the gift of sexual relations with your husband and wife. Brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, this teaching from God's word, is it a word in season for some of us here this morning? Perhaps you're out of control when it comes to what you're doing. Perhaps you've been sleeping around. Perhaps you've been watching pornography, reading things you shouldn't, engaging in sexual activities, and you know it's wrong and displeasing to God as a Christian, and you're crippled by the guilt of it here this morning. Or perhaps you're here this morning, 
and you have just reached the point of not caring anymore as a Christian. Who cares what the Lord Jesus says? Who cares about the implications of this? Let me remind us this morning, God's will is to sanctify you, his people. And he says to all this morning to avoid sexual immorality, to learn to control your own body in a way that is honorable and holy. That is what he's asking. And for those of us who are married who might go, I'm not here, this is not for me. There's a challenge here too, that the way we conduct ourselves is to be in a holy and honorable way that is not reserved for those who are not married, but for all of us. John Stott said in, the, in his commentary, immensely challenging for all who are married or even thinking about getting married, he says this, marriage is not a form of legalized lust, he says. How right he is. That marriage is not a license to have sexual relations at every whim, every desire you have. It's about relationship with your husband and wife. It's about a relationship of love, submission to one another, out of honor and obedience to Christ. We're in Ephesians 5 territory. And so, why does he say in verse 6, in this matter of sexual relations, we are not to step over certain boundaries or take advantage of a brother or sister in Christ. That goes from outside or inside marriage. The warning is in verse 6, you see it, that each of us will be judged for such sins. God, as it were, will stand up for those who've been taken advantage of. So if you're a husband or a wife, and you're cruel and harsh to your husband or wife in this area of your life, read what this warning says. It says that God will judge, because it's not holy and honorable to him. This way of life pleases God, and it is in total contrast to the person who doesn't know God. Look why he says, verse 5, that each of you should control his own body in a way that is honorable and holy, not in passionate lust like the heathen who does not know God. You see, for the person who is not a Christian, and you might be here this morning thinking this teaching is madness, this teaching, this sexual desire is natural, and it should not be curtailed or restricted. Maybe you're thinking that. Maybe you're thinking sexual relations is not conditioned upon whether or not you're married, male or female. What's this? This is madness. But if God, the maker of men and women, the one who gives us sex as his gift, says to his followers, avoid sexual immorality and learn to control your own body in a holy and honorable way, the Christian listens. Why? Because God is their maker, their Lord and God. The Christian knows God and knowing God means living for him, obeying his truth, following his way, pleasing him, this cannot be true for the non-Christian. They don't know God, so why would they? And so act in a different way. Knowing God means a different way of life. Not knowing God means a different way of life too. Why should we be, this is my question probably that I've been thinking through, what should be our motivation and desire to follow this instruction? Let me share a little personal. I, I grew up predominantly in my own background with this area of my life about do's and don'ts. I, was, I grew up in a Catholic background, very strong moral ethic about do's and don'ts. I know what do's and don'ts are, but you know what was lacking in it? A reason for it, a motivation, a factor behind it. Why? You were told, don't do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. But why? And for the Christian, I asked the way I grew up with this, not knowing that. But then God's word teaches us and it sanctifies us. And the beauty of these verses is that Paul outlines what should be our motivation, the why desire for living God's way. And he gives us two things. He firstly says in verse three, you could take us back, it's God's will. This is God's purpose that we would be transformed, part of change in coming into line and teaching of God in this particular area of life. It is God's will that we should live holy and honorable lives, especially in the area of our sexual conduct and behavior from these verses. Verse 7 says, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. He didn't call you to live like the heathen, if you're a believer. He didn't call you to live in passionate lust. He called you to live honorably and holy in this area. And then the second one, which I think is the most important, it is to please God. These Christians had gone from loving other things to loving God and following him and serving him. And part of becoming a Christian 
is that God gives us that desire in our hearts and lives to please him. Not to please him so that we may be made right with him, but rather please, pleasing him out of a gratitude and thankfulness for all that he's done for us. Living this way pleases God. And he gives us, as verse 8 says, the Holy Spirit. Why does he say Holy Spirit? Because he's emphasizing the type of life who will enable us to live this life despite our brokenness, despite our sinfulness, despite our temptations that we face. The Holy Spirit comes in and he will enable us and guide us and teach us and transform us. But to reject this teaching, and I want us to grapple with it, is to reject God. And so it pleases God when we heed his teaching and seek to put it into practice. Plenty of questions, I'm sure, this morning as we come to this passage. But can I say this as, with as much care for those of us here this morning who have transgressed in this area of sexual immorality? It displeases God. It's not God's will for your life. And maybe you're here this morning and you know, you could put hand on heart and say, yep, I made a mistake. I make mistakes in this area. But you know something? If you repent, there's forgiveness there's grace, there's God's mercy. Come and repent. Like David in the Old Testament when he said this, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. He went on to say, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Don't cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. This teaching from 1 Thessalonians this morning is so relevant for us today that as God's people, we receive it as his instruction and authority. None of us have arrived. We are all sinners, but God in his grace forgives and calls us to live a life that is sanctified and holy, particularly in this area. And folks, what I want to do is just leave a moment to kind of respond to God before we look at verses 9 to 12. So let's take a moment just to pray and respond quietly to God before I continue. Father, as we come to this passage this morning, we're conscious, Lord, that our culture and even our own lives are trying to rebuff it. That, Father, we're trying to grapple with things here, and, Lord, our heart goes against it. And we just pray, Father, that, Lord, we would accept this teaching because it is your will and purposes for your people who know you. Father, for those of us who have fallen in this area of life, we pray for forgiveness. We thank you that in Jesus there is restoration. There is, like David prayed, a part where you can create in us a clean heart again and give us a desire to please you and follow after you. And we thank you for that good news. But Father, none of us have arrived in this area. We're in need of your constant transformation of the way that we think the way that we act, and we pray this morning, forgive us. And we pray, Lord, thank you that you are committed to sanctifying your people. And we pray that you will continue to do that within us all here who know you and love you. Lord, help us, we pray, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Amen. And then lastly, to finish, and this is short, verses 9 to 12. In the whole argument of loving one another, which Paul prayed for, you ask the question, what does it look like? Paul returns to the theme of instruction here in verses 9 and 10, and he highlights the fact for these believers. He says, you're loving each other well. Continue to do so. You've been taught by God through his Holy Spirit, and Paul commends them for it in verses 9 and 10. And in so loving others well, Paul goes on and he says in verse 11 and 12, he gives them specific instructions, three in fact. Make it, your, uh, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business and work with your hands. What strange things to say to these Christians. And yet there must have been reason for it. 
And we'll see next week that there was huge concerns about the second coming of Jesus. And for some of the Christians at Thessalonica, they had so believed that Jesus was coming back that they'd given up on work. I wonder this morning if you knew that the Lord was going to come back tomorrow Monday. Hands up if you'd go to work. Hands up if you'd say to yourself, look, I'm out on the deck chair today. I'd give it up. And that's what happened here. They were so convinced, which is lovely, that the Lord would return, that they said to themselves, what do I need to work for? And I guess if you truly believe it, that's what you might do. And what happened was these folk became idle, as chapter 5, verse 14 tells us. And we urge you, brothers, warn those who are idle. They'd become idle. And being idle brings its own issues, doesn't it? And so Paul writes to them, telling them literally, lead a quiet life. Make it your ambition to have no ambition with regards to your life. Obscurity. Don't draw attention to yourself. Lead a quiet life. Folks, most of us are bought into the fact that our life has to be special. No, it doesn't. Live a quiet life. Get on with the work that you've been called to do. You're not something special. You're just an ordinary Joe Soap like the rest of us. And Paul says, lead a quiet life. And then he says to them, mind your own business. The idleness must have meant that they were gossiping, busy about other people's business. And he says, mind your own business. And then he says, work with your hand. And Paul sees two outcomes from this way of life. He says, firstly, that you'll gain the respect of the outsider and that you won't be dependent on anyone else. Loving others by looking after yourself. Not, in, not dependent, but independent. These three principles are as relevant for us today as they were back then. To lead a quiet life, mind your own affairs, and work. And now for some of us it's not possible because of factors of health or dependence or illness. But generally if you can work, work. And this way of life may win the respect of the outsider and you won't be dependent on anyone. God's will is that we should be sanctified and so live a life that pleases God. These instructions and commands this morning are practical, they're relevant and challenging when it comes to our daily living out of our lives. But be encouraged. It is God's will that we be holy and blameless and with the help of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Scriptures, God's holy people, and the Lord Jesus. He is calling us to live holy, blameless lives that love others well. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that the gospel of the Lord Jesus impacts all areas of our life. And this morning, as we look at two specific areas, we pray, Father, that we will Look to the Holy Spirit to help us, to enable us, to teach us, to guide us, to rebuke and challenge and convict us. And Lord, we thank you for just the encouragement that this is your will for our lives, that you're committed to transforming a people who are holy and blameless in your sight. Lord, forgive us of our sins today and lead us out into this week dependent on the Spirit of God to change and transform us, to be more like Christ in every aspect of our lives, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.